Hi, welcome for coming today. My name is Steve Murray. I'm critic in residence for Art Matters. Uh, thank you particularly for coming today. Our uh, symposium on theater in January uh, occurred under a winter storm watch. So today we're under the tornado and flood watch. So we're either doing something really right or something really wrong, but we're consistent. Uh, Art Matters, Engaging the Community Through Embedded Arts Journalists is a collaboration of the Macon Arts Alliance and the Mercer University Center for Collaborative Journalism. It's a one-year program that's funded by the National Endowment for the Arts and the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. Uh, today we're uh, having a co-presentation by Mercer University's Townsend School of Music and the Robert McDuffie Center for Streams. This is the fifth of six public symposia that we're hosting as part of this project. Um, in each of these, we bring together at least one professional artist in a particular medium and one professional critic in that medium, basically to talk about the changing landscape of criticism and the art form in a digital age. The idea really is to just talk about the changing scene, talk about the importance of criticism, or does it matter? Uh, from both sides of the divide, if there is a divide between the artist and the critic. Generally, my idea is to introduce you to very interesting people who know a lot and have a lot of interesting things to say, and I get to sit back and listen like you do, so I should introduce the guests now. At the end, we have, well, actually right here, I'll start the closest, Amy Schwartz Moretti, who is the director, I'm sure many of you know her, director of the McDuffie Center for Strings since its inception in 2007. Prior to that, she was concert master with the Florida Orchestra and the Oregon Symphony. She travels all over the country and in Europe, still performing as well as her extreme duties here. Um, I've lost my place. Oh, she made her solo concerto debut at Carnegie Hall, practice, practice, practice. She's equally at home with chamber music, pop, jazz, everything else. She's been honored by her alma mater, the Cleveland Institute of Music, and by the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. Uh, and through the Stradivari Society of Chicago, and I meant to ask you this, she enjoys the extended loan of a violin from 1744 made by famed craftsman G.B. Guadagnini, named the Canadian. Now, I don't know how this happened, I don't know the provenance, but I love that exquisite pieces of musical craft end up getting nicknames that sound like Tarantino gangsters. So. <laughs> you must tell me that sometime. Yes, okay. Our other guest is Alex Ross. He was a music critic at the New York Times, among other publications, in the early 90s. Since 1996, he has been the music critic for the New Yorker magazine. He's a composer himself, and is, he's the author of several books. The first is The Rest is Noise, Listening to the 20th Century, which was a winner of the National Book Circle, Critics Circle Award and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in general nonfiction. His second was an essay collection called Listen to This, and he is now in the fairly early stages of his latest book, Wagnerism, Art in the Shadow of Music, which actually has a connection with local poet Sidney Lanier, which you might want to mentioned at some point during our conversation. He's a MacArthur Fellow, recipient of an Arts and Letters Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters and of Germany's Belmont Prize. And there's more about these people in your program, so I'm just doing the highlights. So I'm just going to open this up for this conversation by throwing out this very vague question I've warned them about, which is um, tell us a little bit about the role of criticism, of arts criticism in your life, in your career, and uh, Take it from there. Should I start? OK. Well, uh, it's uh, very nice to be here, first of all. And, and thank you all for coming out. And thanks so much um, uh, for the uh, invitation uh, to visit Macon, which did afford me the opportunity this morning to uh, visit uh, also the Sydney Lanier Cottage, uh, because uh, I am working on this book about Wagnerism, uh, Wagner's impact on the arts and intellectual life uh, from his own lifetime to the present. Uh, and Lanier was one of the first uh, significant American artists uh, to take a, a strong interest in, in Wagner. Uh, he was, of course, a musician himself and uh, played in orchestras, played uh, Wagner, uh, thought about him, read his writings, uh, 
sketch translation, uh, beginning of a translation of the libretto of the Ring Cycle, uh, and wrote uh, a fascinating poem about Wagner called uh, A Dream of the Age. Uh, so in any case, it's a nice serendipity for me uh, to be able to continue my, my linear studies as part of the sort of American portion of that book. But um, anyway, to the question. Um, I, 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 I can't accept the description of myself as a composer, <laughs> uh, uh, certainly not anymore. Up until age, I don't know, 16 or, or 17, uh, I, I was making uh, repeated attempts at composing things, whether I qualified as a composer, I'm not sure. Uh, but it was a serious pursuit of mine. Music was a serious pursuit. I played the piano. I played uh, the oboe, not particularly well, uh, but I was uh, just immersed in, in music constantly, uh, whether uh, trying to write it, uh, trying to play it, uh, reading about it, uh, thinking about it. So it was just an abiding obsession from you know, fairly early in, in childhood through my parents' uh, record collection, uh, through lessons uh, at school, and, and so on. Uh, at the same time, I had this passion for writing and for literature, uh, but the two didn't intersect so much. Uh, they seemed distinct, uh, and, and they remained distinct in, in, in college when I ended up being an English literature major, continuing to immerse myself in music on the side, mainly at my college radio station, uh, where I spent a lot of time just listening to records and preparing my radio show and, and talking about music on the air. Uh, and I think my first real pieces of, of music writing would have been uh, these essays on, on a particular composer. And I'd become very interested in, in um, 20th century music. So say I would do a show about Morton Feldman, and I would write a little essay of Morton Feldman and start reading it aloud in the air for the benefit of at most two or three people <laughs> listening at any given time. Uh, and we also we had uh, some CD reviews that we published in, in our program guide. Uh, and I enjoyed that, but I, I didn't think there was any future in it uh, or, or certainly a career uh, in it. And so after college, I pictured myself going to really uh, underpaid, uh, freelance, uh, fifth string uh, critic to, to add to their staff uh, and offered me, I'm not going to call it a job, uh, they offered me an arrangement, <laughs> they offered me an understanding uh, that I would uh, be writing you know, several reviews uh, a week uh, for, for the Times and if I did okay, if I didn't embarrass myself, they would continue assigning me these, <laughs> these reviews. So, so I moved to New York in 1992 and, and started doing that. And uh, I, was, I was very young, I was just two years out of college. Uh, I was, uh, had a great deal to learn and, and I did some of my learning in public and I, and I made mistakes. Uh, but I also did gain this, this tremendous knowledge uh, and decided to stick with it. I actually, I really sort of had my ups and downs and, and wasn't sure whether I wanted to, to continue this kind of work and I actually did apply to graduate schools at one point and, and was all set to sort of go back into academia when uh, the real turning point was when the New Yorker offered me a piece uh, and I did that in, in 1993 and that was such a great experience and such a wonderful combination of uh, journalistic writing but also there was a component of it uh, where I could um, you know, I had time to, to research a topic. Uh, the whole pace of things was, was slower. Uh, There's this wonderfully thorough process at The New Yorker of editing and, and fact checking, uh, uh, which is quite singular and, and uh, makes you seem a lot smarter <laughs> than you really are. And, and that was just a, it was a joyous experience. It was just the, the greatest writing experience I'd ever had. And so I thought, well, I'll stick with this for a little while longer and, and see if the New Yorker might offer me a job someday, which they did uh, three years later. And, and so that was my path. I mean, again, I, I, I did not grow up dreaming of becoming a music critic uh, one day. I think if, when I was 16 or, or 18, or somewhere around that age, if, if someone had said to me, you know, you know, your destiny is to be a music critic, I would have been horrified because it just wasn't, I didn't read critics so much. I just didn't follow. 
um, journalism necessarily, and and my writing tended to be, you know, um, much more kind of weighted by by you know, scholarly uh, jargon, I suppose, when I was in college. Uh, but then, you know, once I tried it, I, I realized I did have kind of a, a knack for it, and also that that people seemed to to like what I was trying to do, and, and so I've I've kept doing it. And and I guess as I've gone along, I've, I've Come to see, define for myself what my mission might be, and, and, and what I'm trying to do as, as a critic, and that keeps evolving, and, and I keep learning and, and discovering new fields to, to delve into. So it's it's an ongoing process. It's it's a strange profession, and and, and there aren't really uh, rules for it. And I find a lot of my colleagues have had the same, often the same kind of serendipitous path uh, into it. Uh, relatively few of us, you know, dreamed of being a, a critic <laughs> from the age of 10. And, and I'd be suspicious of such a person, actually. <laughs> but, right, you know, not that there's anything you know, wrong with it, but uh, <laughs> it's unusual, let's just say that. Uh, so that's, that's sort of how I, how I got into it. Well, of course, um, playing, playing violin and playing music is something um, that's so deeply personal. And I started very young, and um, and I think that it was always a dream of mine that I, I think it was just every day I wanted to play violin and when I stepped on the stage I enjoyed that feeling, I enjoyed sharing music with people. Um, also being an audience member, as I think about music and music criticism, um, you're constantly, it's, it's something that is very personal. and. As musicians, as audience members, we're always being critical of things. And I, I think about my current students. Um, I think about myself when I was young, growing up. Um, every lesson, every day, every second I'm in the practice room, we're being critical of ourselves. Um, and, and learning how to deal with that, learning how to continue to um, improve your playing, stay positive. All of these things. So this has been very interesting as I've been giving it thought, and um, to be sitting on a panel with someone like Alex Ross, who, um, if you're lucky enough to have Alex Ross come to your concert, that already says something about um, what you've reached as as a musician. And um, but even if a critic doesn't come to your concert, that doesn't mean that it's it's not good or not great. Um, there are just so many levels to all of this. Um, but for me, yes, okay, so when <laughs> my mind is just, oh, how many things can we talk about here? There are just so many. Uh, talking to colleagues, um, of course you have the colleagues that say, oh, I never read a review. Yeah, if you, if you trust what the review says and it's good, then you've got to trust it when it's bad, right? When it says something that's not so nice about you. Um, but honestly, I think most people read the reviews, they're looking to get something positive that they can add to their portfolio, um, to be able to put up on their website, to be able to say um, that, oh, they, they said that my sound was like the rippling waves of the, you know, <laughs> of the ocean at this moment, and um, or talking about your virtue, um, virtuosity, and um, music criticism is so important to help define who the good players are, um, but it's also important um, when when you read um, critics that write and give the historical context and help audiences and people to understand um, why a piece was written, um, why the musicians are choosing to play it. All of these things are um, very important for the ongoing um, continuation of classical music as a genre. Um, as I'm now um, running a series here, trying to put on interesting concerts um, for the public here, as we look at programming, these are all things that we take into consideration, trying to um, not only be entertaining, bring the music like Brahms, Tchaikovsky, um, favorite composers of so many, but also trying to bring interesting new pieces to educate and um, make you think. And even if you 
you think, oh, in 100 years, maybe that piece won't be played. It's still important that we're taking in new music. So. Um, it's, it's interesting because, uh, um, of course, you, in your profession, you would be very critical with one another to become the best you can. Um, I think a lot of people think of critics and artists as being antithetical to each other, but even when we were talked about this earlier, it, it seems to me that there's much more these days, even perhaps more important than ever, a symbiosis between the artist, the musician, and the critic, because together, I, I think perhaps you're both trying to find a way to keep the music relevant in the day and age, to give the context, um, and improve things. Is that, yeah. you think that? I think, well, we, we justify each other's existence <laughs> to a great sure. degree. You know, so if, if uh, an opera house in a certain city is, is threatened with closure, uh, the, the, the music critics, well, singular, plural, <laughs> we don't know, uh, uh, will, be, will be up in arms, will, will be aghast, uh, because this is an important part of, of their beat. And, and without uh, an opera company, uh, without uh, you know, regular opera performances, uh, suddenly a huge part of the repertory is, is missing. And, and it diminishes uh, their own work. And I think uh, on the other side, uh, uh, performers and institutions, presenters and so on in, in a certain city uh, can become quite vocal and, and may wish to uh, organize and speak out if uh, the local newspaper is threatening to uh, you know, cut uh, their criticism uh, or, or if some other struggle is, is taking place in, in terms of maintaining a, a critical presence uh, because this is an important uh, window uh, on, on what they do. Uh, they, they like to be written about. They may not always like to be <laughs> reviewed, but, but they, but they you know, understand the need for it. And of course, uh, uh, they like the, the advanced pieces, the previews and, and so on. And just sort of the sense of awareness and the and sense of being part of of a conversation and the role that critics can play in, in articulating, uh, as, you were, as you were saying, uh, what is this music? Where did it come from? Why is a particular piece being performed now? Who is this new composer? Uh, why should we pay attention to him or her? Uh, this, this context uh, in so many different uh, senses is what uh, the, the critic can can show uh, to to the readership, and so yeah, I think on, on either side, there, there we, we <laughs> you know, of course, obviously, we we critics uh, uh, feel the need for for the performers and in, in the institutions, but yeah, on the, on the other side too, I think there's a great, there's a great sense of loss when when the, when the critics in, in, in a certain place disappear, and, and there's no question, you know, we we are we are slowly disappearing in, in, in so many places across the board. And if they're not writing about it, how will people mm -hmm. know what's happening? Um, I know up in Cleveland um, that the critic there was, I don't know how it actually ended up happening in the end, but um, got pulled away from the arts area because I think that he was being critical of the, the conductor there, and um, so I think that's an interesting place for the um, music critic to be in when you want to be honest or you feel that you're being honest about something, but if it's not helping the institution or at least what they think is helping the institution, um, I've seen that happen, and then yes, when, when there just may not be money in the budget to, to have someone go out and, and review a concert, but we do, we absolutely rely on each other. <laughs> so saying that, you're, you're equally affected by, in the past 10, 15 years, the kind of digital revolution that has seen so many traditional media, print media, particularly uh, journalists and critics, disappear. Um, I know we, we sort of touched on, there are more voices now, but you, there's no longer the, the so-called expert writing about music in the same way. What are your thoughts about how the landscape has changed both critically, I think that's clearer, but how has that affected, in your experience, the musical scene? I find it interesting to, um, 
now with all the, yes, with Facebook and, and with all these various ways that things are coming so quickly at you, um, things get passed around that are sometimes hilarious. Like, I can't believe someone just wrote about that. And they're, they're able to write about it and blog about it. Um, and oftentimes, maybe they do know what they're writing about. Um, but yes, in this digital age, things are, are definitely coming out faster. Um, I, yeah, I would be curious to, to hear. Yeah, your well, this is, this is a big subject, and, and people sort of talk about it from different angles. Uh, I, it's, it's very complicated because I, I sort of have two quite distinct feelings uh, about this relationship between sort of the new, whole new sort of digital universe and, and the, the old fashioned print media. You know, uh, on the one hand, there's, there's this big structural problem uh, which has arisen, which we've, I'm sure you've touched on in every single one of these, these panels. You know, what, what happens to just the economic viability of uh, newspapers and magazines when so much now is appearing online, uh, when uh, you know, so many publications made a decision to, to put their content, and the emergence of the word content is already sort of a troubling development in my mind, it's, you know, it's supposed to work. Uh, writing, um, so it's you know, everything sort of going online, being available for free. Then people see their circulation dropping. They they panic. They start putting, trying to put up a paywall. And there's been just a, a host of problems, and, and it's and it's very complicated, and very sort of uh, uh, just not not clear what the sort of underlying economics of it uh, are. But there's just no question. Uh, so many of these these institutions have just trembled. Um, uh, uh, under the pressure of, of these new developments. Um, and, uh, and it's something that we sort of struggle with you know, on a daily basis. This new pressure, you know, if a piece appears online, the, people can now instantly measure you know, how, how many people are, are reading it, uh, hits, uh, which I think is, it can be a really insidious mindset to get into, you know, are, are the most popular pieces uh, the best, you know, what does this do for those of us who are writing in, in areas that, that, that don't have uh, such a large audience, but, but we, we do have a, 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 a strong audience or, or, or a loyal uh, audience, but we sort of disappear off the radar screen when everything is being measured by sort of the maximum number of hits. And, and on and on, I could rant about this well, and, and <laughs> for, the, for a long time. On the musical but, side, I imagine it would be like if, if you only got written about for your Christmas concert, because yeah. people go to them exactly. and yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's sort of this sort of this, this sort of pop hit mentality invading kind of every cultural s sphere, you know. But on the other hand, when you actually look at um, what's being said uh, about classical music uh, on the internet, I think there have been a lot of wonderful developments. Uh, I think there there are a lot of, of really good, very smart blogs out there, and also online only arts sites, uh, the, the Arts Atlanta site, uh, there's a very good site in uh, Milwaukee, uh, the, the Iron, Ar Iron Arts uh, site in, in Washington, uh, D.C., so, uh, a number of others, uh, some, some very smart writing about music and, and other fields, uh, and the bloggers, and, and there are some tremendously smart bloggers, uh, and I can sort of reel off a, a, a list of them uh, in, in um, the, the U.K. as, as well as uh, America, Michaela Baronello, a very smart uh, graduate student who writes about opera uh, on a blog called Likely Impossibilities. Uh, Mark Berry, a uh, brilliant scholar of, of Wagner and a number of other uh, fields, uh, writes these brilliant, often rather slashing uh, reviews on his site in, in, in London. Uh, Tim Rutherford Johnson, uh, a, a brilliant commentator on, on the, the English and, and also European new music scene, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and these voices are, are powerful voices that we didn't have uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, you know, sometimes the bloggers can be eccentric or obsessive, or there may be sort of a, a field of, of interest that they keep hammering away on, but, but it's, um, it's, I think it's sort of opened up the conversation in a great way, especially as sort of the numbers of the number of critics uh, uh, has diminished. Uh, these voices are coming in and, and, and filling a vacuum, and I think it can be wonderful for performers to see, you know, multiple voices 
now uh, sort of talking about a particular concert, not just the one critic of the one newspaper in town, but, but a couple of bloggers, uh, too, or, or people writing for, uh, for an online site. It's just so healthy to have multiple voices uh, instead of a kind of a, a monopoly. You know, I, I guess the question is, how do we know that people are going to all those sites? And I mean, well, yeah. we don't and often they have very, very small uh, right. readership. Right. You but know. I, I agree, multiple um, voices. But still, it's, it can grow uh, over mm -hmm. time, and, and uh, this, this is just so important to have this, this conversation, you know, this sense mm -hmm. of, uh, um, you know, an, an event has happened, and, and people are talking about it, and, and reviews and, and commentary online are, and off are the sort of reassuring evidence that, that, this, that it, it, it did happen, and it has some kind of you know, measurable effect, and, and of course, those the smarter of those reviews can also perhaps be used in promotional materials and, and all that kind of thing, which is, which is you know, part of the ecosystem uh, that we all inhabit. So, so I, I'm, I'm as discouraged as I am when I sort of look over the whole landscape uh, of, of our sort of, you know, the digital world that, that we live in. You know, when I look at classical music itself, uh, I, I see, you know, just, just more writing and, and often smarter writing. It's interesting that I, I think it's really terrific that we're having this discussion here. This is going to sound like a, you know, a silly and obvious commercial, but uh, two very interesting experiments are going on here at Mercer. You have the Center for Collaborative Journalism, which is sort of a new doctor's hospital training model for young journalists having hands-on experience, kind of almost like learning how to survive in the real world while also getting the skills to be reporters. Uh, and then at the Center for Strings, there is the focus on not just learning how to play beautifully and learn your craft, but also life skills and, mm -hmm. as you say, entrepreneurial to really exist in the real world, which seems to be increasingly an important part of the age we live in. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Um, speaking about um, what the Center for Strings is doing, um, I find it interesting each day trying to discover um, the, the path that every student should take, and they all have their interests, and not only with their instrument, um, but outside of the instrument too. Um, but I think with regards to dealing um, with music criticism, I think it will be important as they figure out how to become the independent contractor, how, how they may set up their own um, concert series one day where they may have to end up being, um, there may not be the management of the orchestra, they may be the musician who's um, helping to run the orchestra in the future. Um, learning how to come up with interesting programming, um, I think that's the, the responsibility of the um, musicians. Um, picking interesting programming that will please their audience, um, but they also have to pick programming that, yes, might um, be attractive to a music critic um, or someone who's looking uh, to see what interesting thing is going on. Um, I do find it interesting um, kind of going along this path of programming, um, finding the right balance, not being apologetic about the fact that we still do want to play Brahms, play a Brahms trio, um, play, play a Tchaikovsky symphony, and not being apologetic about that, um, but still, still thinking outside of um, what's the up and coming composer now, what's something interesting that we feel comfortable playing, um, that would work within the programming. Um, I just recently played a concert where um, we played Paul Schoenfeld's Cafe Music, which I think is one of the most popular 20th century trios that was, um, that's been written recently. And the audience immediately jumps to their feet at the end of it, as opposed to the Brahms trio. Um, it's, it was very interesting to see that. Um, and there it is, something contemporary. Yet it's not that it's not the um, it's very accessible, likable music, and um, 
a critic may not show up to hear cafe music played anymore because it's become such a staple in the repertory. Um, so it, that's an interesting thing to me and I think for the students as, um, and, and maybe you can talk about that, like how do you, um, selecting the concerts that you might want to attend or what is interesting? Is it the idea of having a theme for the program or is it the, um, or the interest within the repertoire? Yeah, it's a great topic. It's something that I think about a lot and, and I think uh, just about every critic uh, takes a, a particular interest in imaginative programs, uh, surprising programs, uh, programs that uh, contain new works or that manage to place old works in, in a uh, new and surprising context. I mean, it, 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 first of all, it, it makes our job a little easier <laughs> if there's, there's some sort of uh, narrative uh, that, that we can take note of in the review in, in our pieces, a, a through line uh, that we can describe, uh, a sense of, a, of uh, an emerging that this particular program, this particular group of pieces had some kind of goal in mind. There was something that, that, it, that it wanted to accomplish. It's not simply just a bunch of things that were slapped together for, for no apparent reason. Not that there's anything necessarily wrong with that because a, a, a performer of uh, sufficient magnitude uh, makes you stop caring about, about those questions and, and, and the, the, the through line, the narrative becomes just the the, the, the drama of his or her uh, playing and, and, and personality. Um, but, you know, it, this, this is a, a, a wonderful addition, you know, if there is some spark of imagination um, in, in, in the program. Uh, and it, it, it can sort of draw our attention, you know, if we have on a particular night the sort of two or three events happening, I think a lot of us will tend to choose the one that, that has a premiere. Uh, that, that, ha that has uh, a, a work by an older composer that, that hasn't been played in, in, in a while and seems to be some kind of rediscovery. You know, that, that, that will sort of uh, win over our interest. You know, certainly when I'm thinking about my work in The New Yorker, where I, I'm not based just in New York, but I go around the country, you know, I, I'm not gonna travel halfway across the country to see you know, a revival of La Traviata with a pretty good cast. You know, as, absolutely satisfying as that experience may be, I, I'm not gonna be able to justify it you know, to my editors in, in terms of the, the travel budget <laughs> uh, to do that. Uh, but if there is a, a premiere of a, of a uh, work by an interesting composer on a, on a striking uh, topic, you know, it's much more likely that, that I would uh, uh, be able to make that kind of trip. Uh, so programming is, is really, really important. And something else that occurs to me that critics can, in a sense, provide a, a model for, uh, or just sort of even getting past critics. I mean, when we think about um, writing about music, uh, talking about music, the language uh, around music, it, of course it's not just critics uh, who are doing this. Everyone is talking about music. Uh, and, and these days, in this kind of new entrepreneurial uh, universe that we're living in, I think more and more we find performers talking about pieces beforehand, uh, writing a little program note, explaining you know, what they wanted to do uh, in a particular concert, uh, giving interviews, uh, maybe uh, you know, writing a little essay that, that would appear in a local publication, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is all very important, I think, in this climate where there's so many competing choices and, and, and so much uh, that, that people can, can do on any given night, uh, very often including just staying home and <laughs> so not going out at all. You know, so you know, why, why, why would you go out? What, what, is, what is happening uh, in this uh, concert uh, that sort of makes it important for you to attend? And, and so uh, the language around music uh, becomes becomes very important, and, and so we didn't. We don't need to sort of think about it, this just in terms of of criticism, but talking about music, writing about music. I think yeah, every every music school, every music program uh, should have some focus on you know how do we how do we express ourselves um, uh, in and around music. It's it's really important, and I think there are techniques that you can learn, and there there are models 
uh, you can study and you can develop a knack for it. You know, look, look at a, a pianist like Jeremy Dick, uh, who is, is a very gifted player and, and, his, and his career uh, was, was going along uh, quite well, uh, but first through a blog, uh, that he was writing, uh, and then through some pieces uh, for publications, uh, including The New Yorker, uh, he showed that he had an extraordinary gift uh, as, as a writer, and, and I think it's just absolutely one of the leading uh, writers on music uh, that, that we have now. Uh, just a fantastically um, interesting uh, commentator, and, and I think this has undeniably uh, broadened his audience and set him apart, you know, because he's now sort of in the, in the category uh, almost like Glenn Gould, uh, who was this this brilliant, um, just uh, just a, a phenomenon as 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 a as a writer of considerable magnitude, aside from his uh, piano playing. So it, it can <laughs> it can actually do a great deal for your career. Well, one reason I, I've mentioned that uh, I know you don't consider yourself a composer, but even having tried to be a composer as a young person, I think that's. For me, very interesting for a critic to have that personal experience with the art they're writing about, and not all critics do have that, but I do think we're seeing you know, an interesting blurring of the line between critic and artist, as you're talking about you know, people who can really write about what they do. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, Amy, I imagine with an academic setting, you theoretically have the luxury, you could program whatever you want, but obviously you're trying to get people here so the point is, you know, I think creating a larger community where the divisions between the artist and the critic and the audience, perhaps those divisions need to become more permeable. So the question is, how do we work moving forward as artists and as critics to engage the community, to give them, in a way, ownership of the work and uh, find, help them find a way to talk about it in a way that's useful for everyone, uh, instead of having this idea about ivory tower and experts and just elite mm -hmm. musicians or something. Does that make sense? Yes. It's a big question. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know, and I think that we're trying to answer that all the time. Um, of course, from the musician perspective, we spend so much of our time um, in the practice room, isolated, trying to hone our craft, um, but then part of that is understanding the historical context of the pieces that you're working on. Um, I have found exactly what you're talking about um, with speaking to the audience beforehand, before the pieces, um, has been helping. Um, it also makes you as a performer more real. They hear your voice. They, um, it's not just you and the instrument. Um, of course, I'm much more um, at home just playing and not having to speak at all. Um, but this is something that we're also working on with the students, that um, we're having them take a public uh, a communications uh, speaking class here, and um, they're doing a, some music and writing. And um, I think it is important to be able to talk about music I grew up, my family, my, my parents taught me, if you don't have something nice to say, don't open your mouth. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so it's, it's a little bit of um, balancing that too, because I think, um, and those are my students who have me, I always approach things from a very positive um, standpoint. I think it's okay not to like some music. Um, I think it's okay. If, if you hear something that um, is contemporary and you don't like it, it's quite possible that that piece will not end up being played into the future. Um, but where I'm going with this is that um, it's important that we discover new music. It's important that we do figure out how to write about it. Even if we don't like it, someone else may like it. Um, And then having people like Alex Ross, like Jeremy Dank, um, hopefully able to put it in writing, hopefully able to put it into words um, so that the broader community will know what we're doing, understand what we're doing. I think getting out into, you know, people are now doing the going to play in bars, going to play in um, 
unusual venues, and I think that that all is very good. It makes music much more accessible. However, the music sounds the best in places like this. Um, our instruments were really made to, um, to, to play in a resonant space. Um, but I think all of these things are important in, in, ter in terms of making um, classical music accessible to people. Yeah, oh, and you brought up sort of the, the line between critic and artist, uh, critic and performer. I mean, it's, it's a little bit of a tricky issue because you, you, do, you don't want that line to become too permeable. I mean, at least from my point of view, uh, you know, the critic needs to have uh, a certain independence. Uh, it needs to be, in my mind, and, and other of my colleagues might disagree, uh, on this, uh, just standing somewhat apart, uh, because you, you don't want to be, you know, unduly influenced by uh, sort of sp spending a lot of time with uh, uh, performers. Of course, there's a sort of awkward situation that might develop if uh, you become good friends with a particular composer, and then the next week you go to hear uh, his new symphony and and you don't like it. And so what, you know, what, what do you do? Uh, so I, I think the reasons for a sort of a, a, a line of, of separation uh, in that sense for, for a long time. There was really a hard and fast rule of the New York Times that the uh, critics were, were not supposed to uh, mix with the performers at all. It was, it was uh, really uh, forbidden uh, for, for any kind of uh, socializing, uh, uh, even sort of modest socializing to be uh, going on. Uh, I think that might be taking it a little bit to the extreme because, of course, you, you learn from uh, speaking uh, with performers uh, by uh, chatting with them uh, about their work uh, and even more by observing uh, what they do uh, behind the scenes. Uh, for me, I mean, this takes the form really of uh, I, I don't seek out uh, a lot of uh, relationships and, and, and friendships, and, and generally, for the most part, uh, avoid too much contact. But very regularly at The New Yorker, I'm writing uh, profiles, reported pieces uh, on uh, a particular conductor or, or instrumentalist, uh, or sort of watching the creation of a new opera behind the scenes, uh, following a, a string quartet. Uh, on tour, this kind of thing, uh, and it's a it's a very different relationship. I'm I'm really no longer a critic. I'm observing with a critic's ears, and my critical sensibility is uh, evident in in the piece. But above all, I'm a journalist. I'm a reporter. I'm simply observing and describing uh, uh, neutrally uh, and just uh, as as closely and as perceptively as, as I can manage, you know, what, what is going on? How do these people do uh, what they do and what are they trying to achieve? And, and I've, I've learned an enormous amount uh, from those projects. And every time I, I write about an artist in that way, um, the relationship is changed. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to hear them the same way again, whether or not there's any subsequent contact. It's just, it's just from a more uh, intimate kind of uh, relationship. But I feel this is a part of a, just a very valuable library uh, of my own experiences, and I bring it to bear when I resume uh, the role of uh, the critic. Uh, so in that sense, yes, there, there is a kind of a, a permeability or, or I'm sort of uh, stepping a little bit you know, outside of, of the role of, of just sort of the absolutely isolated um, coldly detached uh, observer uh, sitting in, on the seat, uh, in the seat on the aisle uh, in the concert hall. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's all, there's all kinds of interesting stories in terms of how critics came to be doing what they were doing and, 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 and what was their training beforehand. And the vast majority of us, I actually can't think of a, of a single case of a, a colleague of, of mine who didn't have some kind of uh, musical training, not that it's absolutely necessary, but it just seems to be this is this is how you this is how you get into music, you know these these days. Uh, I mean, I think so many of us fell in love with classical music at a pretty early age because we played an instrument uh, or because we we tried to uh, compose. It was just the, the 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 way we became immersed in it, and then later something changed, and, and we ended up uh, writing about it. But yeah, I mean, 
uh, Tony Tomasini, the uh, chief music critic of the New York Times, uh, is uh, a, a, a trained pianist and uh, a quite good one, uh, and also has a, a, a doctorate in, in music, uh, and, and so uh, he has quite <laughs> strong uh, credentials uh, in that sense, and, and there are a lot of others uh, who, who have had uh, considerable training and, 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 and do have considerable knowledge. Um, so yeah, I, I resist the sort of the standard crack that you know, the, the, the critic is someone who just you know, couldn't hack it, and, and uh, you know, those who, who can't do right. Uh, but um, it's, 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 more, it's more complicated than that, and, and ultimately, we've, whether we intended it from an early age or not, we're, we're doing sort of what, what we were destined uh, to do. I mean, this, this, this really has combined our talents uh, for, for music and, and for writing in, in a constructive way most of the time. <laughs> well, unless there's something that we haven't discussed among ourselves, I'd love to open it up for questions. Please. One thing that I'm not really excited about a lot of your work, especially your blog, um, this, I hope I characterize this correctly, you are not only engaged in critical work, but also in sometimes curatorial work. I think you've been invited to different symphonies or different houses to set up concert series and be a like intellectual input for the musical programming. Um, and I guess I see that, that shifting relationship with the critic moving into an also a creative capacity as something that's really exciting on the international team or on the national team, um, but that is much harder to implement or doesn't happen as much on a local level, like in this atmosphere like maybe Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wonder if there are any kind of ideas on the pulse of the place of music critic if they exist at all in a small community in terms of the critic about the place. Yeah, I mean, it was very exciting for me. Uh, a couple of things have happened uh, in, in this area. Uh, one was that I was invited by the Australian Chamber Orchestra to curate, uh, as you say, a, a couple of programs for them uh, based more or less on, on the two books uh, that I've written, uh, and then to go there and to do pre-concert talks um, um, before each event on a national uh, Tour, tour across uh, Australia, which was just extraordinary for me. I mean, I, I'd been to Australia once before, but to, to see, to, to go from one end of the continent to another, uh, to travel with the orchestra, um, uh, to watch the, the changes, uh, sort of the slight changes in the program from, from night to night, to, to be a participant in that sense. It, again, it sort of falls in that category of, of, uh, of, of, a, of a great, experience, really an educational experience that I can draw upon uh, in my other work. Uh, the other thing that happened was that the South Bank Center in London became interested in the idea of having a year-long festival based on uh, my first book, The Rest is Noise, a, a massive undertaking that involved more than a, a hundred concerts and dozens of different uh, ensembles and, and, and groups. Um, and uh, I went over and, and gave a series of, of lectures um, for that. Uh, in that case, uh, I chose early on not to be involved at all in the programming. It was, it was entirely their thing. Uh, I just, first of all, it was just too complicated for me to even uh, get into. You know, programming is, is an art, and, and, and it requires, I think, a tremendous uh, kind of knowledge and, and that you need to have an intuitive understanding of, of your audience and a lot of it, of course, is simply dependent on the musicians. What do they want to play? What is practical? How many new or unusual pieces is it practical for them to learn? Uh, you know, it, it's just there are many, many factors. I didn't, you know, I don't know the London scene nearly well enough to be able to get involved in those kinds of decisions. And also, I didn't feel it was appropriate for me as, as, a, as a working professional critic to, uh, to, to have that degree of involvement. I think the, the Australian. Uh, case was sort of a, a, a one-time thing in, in a country that I, you know, very rarely go to. And, and uh, with, with in, in, in the London case, I just felt that too, too, too much of, of a curatorial involvement might, might begin to uh, affect my, my other writing. And, and, and I, 
thought it would be better for me to, to have this sort of more detached role. Uh, so that, that was sort of the, the arrangement that we came up with in, in the case of, of South Bank. But still, again, I learned a tremendous amount from watching this come together uh, and being a participant as, as, a, as a lecturer. Uh, so in terms of you know, talking about someone in a particular place, a, a critic in Macon or, or any other city, it's tricky. Uh, if, if, you're, if you're becoming involved, if you're sort of taking an active role as a participant in events uh, in your immediate area, you, know, you have to be wary of losing your independence uh, and, and sort of questions of, of conflict of, of interest. Uh, if you're sort of involved as a, as a curator uh, for a particular institution and then you know, a year later you're appearing as, as a critic, uh, and, and uh, reporting on what they do. It's, it's tricky. I, I think you know, they, with, with the right awareness and, 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 and the right uh, sense of um, uh, limitations, uh, it, it, it could work, but I think you would have to be quite sparing about, about how you do it. Uh, but, I think there, but there are many other roles for the critic to play, you know, not only as, as a, a curator, but just being a presence in, in one form or another, whether by speaking, by, by being on the scene, by being in communication with audiences, with performers, with institutions in, in any given place. Um, but yeah, we're, we're into a sort of a gray area and it's sort of difficult to, to set rules for, for how this should uh, play out. And uh, I mean, I've had other invitations to be involved in that kind of curatorial way and, and, and I decided not to do it just because, you know, I, I felt I couldn't go too far uh, with these sort of projects as much as I, I enjoyed them and, 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 and they were just you know, tremendously enjoyable for me. A question here? Yeah. Um, I, I'm a and uh, I think one of the good mosaics is, is in the way just in politics, because and by politics is normally just a lot of the power and culture and there's uh, a raw environment. But as a performer, we always learn, I think, to not be out of But I think it was a critic. I, I ju I'm just wondering if uh, you have any specific uh, opinion on you about how performance engages with politics and how is that different from uh, a curatorial view? Do you want to take that on? He's one of my, he's in the center, so I'm sure he wants to hear your answer. <laughs> but I've been sitting here, your, your response too. I'll, I'll do a follow up. Yeah. I mean, well, it, it does seem to be something that, that comes up more and more. I, I suppose when I first started out more than 20 years ago now, frighteningly, uh, I, I don't remember political concerns being quite so much to the fore. And, sort of, and there's sort of many different forms that this kind of quote unquote political conversation can take. Uh, sometimes it's about the role of an institution, the state of an institution within a, a particular locale, um, its relationship to the donors, uh, a, a conflict between, uh, between a management and, and, and musicians. Obviously, we've seen a whole lot of this in, in, in recent years. And, and that just conversation inevitably becomes political uh, when, when you have uh, uh, a group of wealthy donors on one side and unionized musicians on another, sort of instantly you're having a political conversation and the management sort of somewhere uh, in, in the middle. Uh, so there's, there's that kind of politics. And then you have uh, international politics. Obviously we've, we've had uh, a lot of discussion in, in recent months and, and years uh, about uh, Russian uh, performers, about uh, Valery Gergiev and Anna Netrebko and uh, their role uh, their relationship with uh, the current regime. I'm, I'm not going to get into this uh, uh, here, but I'm just sort of notice. I'm just noting the the prominence of, of these kinds of conversations. And of course, it happened before, and uh, certainly, you know, in the early mid 20th century, uh, music was intensely uh, politicized uh, in, in every uh, imaginable way. Um, but it's striking. I mean, it does seem to be coming more to the fore. And yeah, the, the critic, I think, needs to be uh, taking on these topics uh, as 
incredibly tricky as they can be, you know, not only from just the point of view of they're divisive and, and, and your readers are going to have, you know, their radically different points of view from, from different sides, but also in terms of, well, just understanding what is really going on here and, and, and what are the layers of, of complexity uh, in these disputes. And there's sort of be what you see on the surface from a distance, and then if you if you really spend time and and report, if you're really working as a reporter and, and speaking one on one with with different participants in a particular conflict, uh, uh, you can come up with a, a picture which is just less clear or less sort of you know uh, uh, simplistic. And and so I, I sometimes I mean when the latest kind of hullabaloo erupts in, in a particular place over an orchestra or, or uh, opera company, I sometimes sort of like to wait for jumping in, just immediately spouting my off-the-cuff opinion because, you know, I, I, I want to read some, some well-reported pieces from the local critics, uh, the local journalists, uh, trying to piece together uh, what's happening uh, before, you know, I, I chime in with, with my opinion. But th these are really important matters. Um, music just, you know, I, I mean, one difference between our current age and, and you know, 20 years ago or, or, or 10 years ago, it, the, the money, there's just less money available now for culture. Uh, there's less government, uh, city, state, and, and, and of course, uh, federal support for the arts uh, than ever. Money is harder to come by. Uh, and this creates some, some enormous uh, pressures on, on all of us. Uh, and, and it becomes a political conversation, and, and we need to grapple with it, and, and it needs to be part of our work. And, and maybe in an ideal world, we, we wouldn't be getting into politics. We would just be talking about Brahms and, and how wonderful Brahms was. But you know, Brahms was a political figure in his time. There were certainly, you know, there's, there's, there's politics behind everything. You know, how our great masterpieces were, were paid for, uh, what powers uh, supported uh, the, the composers in our canon and, and funded opera houses and, and, and orchestras and ensembles from, from one ear to another. It has always been uh, a political conversation, so I totally reject the idea that I think that you know, politics is somehow suddenly invading uh, the musical sphere. It's, it's always been that way. But yeah, I'd love to hear your take on these kind of things, if you're willing. Oh, I know, <laughs> if I'm willing and able to. Um, yeah. The, it's interesting, and from the, um, oh, do people have class? Which they do. Way. Okay. <laughs> Bye to those of you who have class. Um, but for those but, of you who can stay, we'd, be, we'd love to hear your questions. Yeah. Farewell, Symphony. <laughs> <laughs> So politics and Rogerio, I, were you talking about? Are you talking about more um, governmental kind of things? Are you talking about politics within just human relations, like what we're kind of addressing? Politics, yeah. Of well, I think in any any business, any um, whenever you get people together, there's always politics at play in some way or another. Um, the beauty that I find in music is that I can escape that <laughs> um, while I'm playing. Um, but it is important to understand how to work with people. Um, of course, being knowledgeable. Um, even if it's knowledgeable about um, someone's nationality, um, the nationality of the composer that you're playing, the, the people that you're playing with, you know, understanding all of this, um, I think what you're touching on with the with the donors and the um, as musicians, we do rely. I, I, of course, we could just play our instrument, we can practice, we can um, play out on the street corner, but we do rely on. Um, 
it to be funded in some way and um, figuring out how to navigate that and, um, and be gracious and understand um, what you're doing is important. Um, but yeah, as far as um, all the politics, yeah, it's interesting as you, as you go through your life and, and figure things out. Oh, sure. It, it could well be, although, you know, a piece doesn't necessarily justify ex its existence by appealing to posterity. You know, there are works that, that, that may serve their own time and then more or less disappear, and, and you mentioned this, playing a piece that you, just, you have a strong hunch that, that in 100 years probably people aren't going to be <laughs> paying attention uh, to this music and it may be completely forgotten, but nonetheless, it, it serves a role, uh, it, it, it fills a gap, it, it simply preserves the, the place of the new uh, on programs. And, and of course, you know, it just has to be uh, stressed over and over again, um, is that this, this idea that programs uh, are dominated by the works of no longer living composers uh, by the composers of past centuries um, is, is a quite recent development. It really became uh, uh, cemented and, 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 and really um, spread widely only in the latter half of the 19th century. Uh, and, and before that, uh, new works uh, were in the majority or, or, or you know, older works just would hardly be touched at all, uh, except um, with sort of certain uh, church repertories and, and sort of other specialized uh, environments. And, and so this, this canon of masterpieces of the past, this, this is a fairly recent uh, development. Um, I, I think in some ways it is a rather un, unnatural one, you know, as, as wonderful as these pieces are. As, as fantastic as they are, uh, I don't think it's healthy uh, for the long-term life of the, of the art form uh, for, for the past to have, uh, to be casting so huge a shadow on the present. And of course, you think about uh, new audiences, uh, younger audiences, and, and the fact that, that people are so much more drawn to, to pieces that, um, speak to their own time, you know, voices, the voices of, of contemporaries uh, who are speaking one way or another about contemporary issues. Um, this is the case so much in, in theater, in the contemporary art world, uh, in, in so many other art forms, um, in, 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 in writing, in, in, in literature, in fiction, obviously. Um, and in, in classical music, uh, we have this this peculiar preponderance uh, of uh, the, the works of the past. And it's always something that, that I feel it just needs to be addressed and needs to be redressed and, and, the, and the balance needs to shift and you know, not to get rid of, of all the, uh, the, 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 the masterpieces by, by uh, any means, but just to, to find a healthier balance. Uh, but this is me pontificating on one of my favorite subjects. And in terms of you know, works now, I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're, they're sort of, avant-garde works that I listen to that, that I find tremendously exciting. Uh, the, it's sort of hard to conceive of, of them having uh, an audience beyond the you know, 20 or 30 people who may sort of show up in some dank, dark uh, space uh, to, to hear them. But you know, time and again, we've seen how some of the most abstruse and, and esoteric and, and even you know, alienating pieces uh, have acquired a much bigger audience uh, over time. Uh, and you know, Schoenberg 
remains a, a controversial composer more than 100 years after he you know, more or less introduced uh, atonality, uh, abandoned uh, tonal harmony, and he still has the capacity to alienate audiences. Uh, but it's very difficult to imagine a, 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 a musical universe without Schoenberg. I mean, he's had an enormous influence. You know, if you just think of you know, trying to uh, you know, make a, a sort of contemporary Hollywood movie with the, the, the sort of tonal language of 1907, you know, just before Schoenberg came on the scene. Uh, it's difficult to imagine a, a sci-fi movie or, or a horror movie or even just ordinary action movie without uh, Schoenbergian dissonance, without this, this expanded uh, harmonic uh, spectrum. And, uh, you, know, it's, you know, the fact that uh, John Cage ended up influencing the, the Beatles and Stockhausen is on the cover of, of uh, Sergeant Pepper and, and how all these sort of uh, uh, you know, indie rock bands today are, are very well versed in, in post-war electronic uh, music and, and minimalism and, and Steve Reich, you know, minimalism, which now seems so ubiquitous. I mean, Steve Reich, I think, is a great example of, of, of what you're talking about, a composer who in the 1960s seemed to be just an absolute freak who was writing this, this music that just people found infuriating and, and just totally uh, unacceptable. Um, and you know, 1973, there's a famous riot in Carnegie Hall where his four organs was being played and, and a woman supposedly went up to the front of the stage and started banging with her shoe and just saying, stop, stop, I confess, <laughs> or something like that. You know. You know, and now Steve Reich, um, his, his great Music for 18 Musicians was played at the Big Ears Festival before a, a huge crowd of sort of, you know, 20-something indie rock fans, and, and they went completely berserk with enthusiasm. With, it was, you know, an ecstatic. I wasn't there, but this is the report I read. And, and so this, this kind of transformation uh, can happen just, just in, a, in a single generation or a couple of uh, generations. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> That's Beethoven. Yes. <laughs> yes. I want to hear my <laughs> They hated my late string quartets. <clears throat> it seems that there's a growing threat towards classical musicians to sustain a Oh, well, that's a good question. Yeah, do, do I worry that writing negative reviews will somehow endanger uh, the art form itself? I mean, do I feel an extra pressure to be uh, supportive and, and encouraging and simply try to get people to, to pay attention and to go to concerts? Um, I, I don't think so. I mean, first of all, I, I don't write a whole lot of, of negative reviews, it's just sort of never been part of my, um, I'm not gonna say job description, but, but just somehow at, at the New Yorker, because I'm selective, I, I don't write about everything, I don't write every week, and, and I don't write about uh, everything I see. I'm, uh, I, I select particular events that seem notable or, or representative, and, uh, and very often it's because I feel, well, something important is happening. There's a new composer, there's sort of a new instrumentalist uh, um, whom I, I want to sort of draw attention to. But, but it can also be representative in, in a negative way if, if I feel that a, a, a major opera company in, in New York is taking a serious wrong turn with their production of the ring cycle, say, I, I feel very much an obligation to to say that and to say it in, in an honest way, because I've, I've got to be honest. Uh, if, I, if I'm writing pieces that are calculated toward sort of having a, a certain effect, uh, toward sort of reaching an, an audience in, in, in a certain way and sort of sending a certain message, uh, I'm lost. You know, it's, it's got to be what I feel. The gut reaction has to be the point of 
departure, uh, and if I'm modifying that and disguising that, particularly you know, if it's a sort of a, a, a negative reaction, um, then I don't know what I'm doing anymore. I'm, it's, it's more something more in the nature of, of uh, publicity or, or, or something else. And so I think, and every, every critic has to, has to, to stick with, with that gut reaction. You mentioned that, that Cleveland uh, situation, and, and, and there was a case of a, of a critic uh, whose, whose negative reviews were felt to be you know, doing damage um, to, to the local orchestra, uh, but, but he was speaking his mind. And, uh, and you, you, ha you know, if you're gonna have a critic do you, you, in, in, in you know, any given town, uh, you need to give them uh, independence. You know? And that's, that's why we need professional critics. Uh, because um, if, if, you're, if you're paying someone, if a newspaper is uh, paying uh, a critic, uh, they are very much paying for uh, independence. It, it means you know, the, the, the newspaper is, is paying their way if they go out of town uh, to see a concert and no one else is, is, is picking up the bill. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I mean, back in the 19th, 18th, 19th centuries, there was, there was a lot of bribery going on and, and, and a lot of uh, corruption. And I think in, in the 20th century, we, we developed a sort of a more ethical way of, of doing criticism. Um, I mean, you also had composers writing reviews of each other's works and, you know, Berlioz and, and Schumann, and, and, and they, were, they were brilliant writers as well as extraordinary composers, but, you know, you, you weren't getting uh, uh, really sort of detached and, and objective uh, criticism a, a lot of the time. So, and I think this is worth um, preserving, so I guess that would be my, my reaction. Um, but I was wondering what, what you would say about the idea of has it actually, is it now simply harder to sustain the dwindling a career? Yeah. Is, it, is it become materially, palpably more difficult? It's interesting for myself. I have not felt that way. Um, I know when I played with the, the two orchestras that I played with professionally, um, there was always the talk of, oh, well, the, the audience is getting older and what do we do? Um, but I think that that talk has been going on for so long. I think people reach a certain age when then they either have more expendable income um, or have more time to be able to do that. Because I think about the stage of life that I'm in now, I've got two young kids to actually want to go out and buy a ticket to something and go see um, something. If I'm not playing in it, you know, but here I am, a musician. Um, it becomes difficult to choose what you're going to go to. I think it's going to be, um, as far as dwindling crowds, I don't know, it's something that we're, we're I think it's, we're always gonna have to deal with. Um, along the lines um, of what we're talking about, I, when pieces would have been played, um, these, these masterworks that we're talking about, the, the more um, historic museum type pieces, they wouldn't have had the, um, and I'm gonna sound, now I'm gonna age myself, but the Britney Spears, or who, who I don't know, the, the real popular um, people, who are performing pop things, Justin Bieber, right? Justin Bieber, <laughs> that, no, he's no. Okay. He's, he's up to date. Yeah, uh, some of the boy Miley bands. Cyrus. I know, Miley Cyrus, <laughs> right. <laughs> so those people, you know, they, they have now become what is popular, and back in the day, Mozart would have been very popular, <laughs> at least in his well. crowd, in his, in his court. He had his struggles uh, too. Yeah, uh, but, um, that's why I was talking about that I don't feel apologetic that I'm playing those pieces. Those are the pieces that I grew up, that's why I fell in love with um, playing the violin. And um, I do think about the majority of pieces that when you go to conservatory, the majority of the pieces you're playing are um, 19th century, aren't they? Um, 18th century. Um, but it is important. We end up having a contemporary music ensemble, or you start to learn about it in history. Every once in a while, it's like, oh, a competition asks for a contemporary piece. OK, we better pick one and do it. And um, this discussion today has made me even think um, more clearly about, um, about that. But when you talk about some of these, um, I'm going to get back to the dwindling crowds in a second. But um, when you talk about some of the um, contemporary pieces, a lot of them nowadays, I'm gonna be playing something this summer that um, 
I'm going to be standing here, the person's going to be standing there, there's a um, guy with the water and the gong and, the, and there's some <laughs> singing and there's, um, I don't know what all else, I haven't even seen the score yet. Um, but it isn't as easy to teach that in a lesson, you know, your hour lesson each week, um, but it is something to be, be aware of that that type of music is being played. Um, we've done some interesting things on this stage, um, but you don't see that as much. As, you definitely see more the, the Mona Lisa um, museum pieces. Um, now, as far as the dwindling audiences, when I'm doing my chamber music concerts, I see very full audiences as I'm performing around. Um, and I just met someone the other day who was not introduced as a youngster to it. He, it wasn't until he was 29 that he discovered classical music and now he's trying to learn how to play violin and um, comes to all the concerts. So um, that proves my theory that we need to definitely have it in the public schools. Um, but I think learning classical music at a young age is so important and I hope um, I hope that that will always continue, but I was so pleased to meet someone who had come to classical music at an older age um, and come to love it. I think it's, it's just our job to sustain this music, and part of that is playing the masterworks. Of course, that's going to be, um, you know, now we have how many conservatories around the land um, training how many numbers of people to play violin, cello, oboe, horn. Um, a lot of yeah, responsibility. We also have more orchestras <laughs> and, and opera houses than, than we did yeah. uh, 60, 70 years ago. I mean, there was a, there was a huge wave of them uh, being founded in, in so many towns and cities after the, the Second World War, especially in the 1960s, the, the period in which the Ford Foundation and other groups were, were giving uh, so much support. Uh, so there, there was actually a, a, a proliferation, you know, and, and I think 100 years ago, if you're trying to make a living as uh, a horn player or sort of any other instrument, <laughs> there, there were simply a, a lot fewer jobs. Uh, so it, you know, the, the picture is always changing. The classical music crisis has been going on for a very long time. It's very interesting to go back and read publications from the, just right at the end of the 1960s, um, the early 1970s, there was a great wave of fear and all the same phrases were in circulation. The aging audience, the dwindling audience, declining revenues, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and people felt that, that this really might all be coming to an end, and especially in the sort of era of the 60s and the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, all the young people seemed to be no longer paying attention to classical music and, and their art form. Uh, their, this, the music that they took seriously and, and analyzed and argued about was rock music and, and, and not classical music. And everyone in classical music at that time felt this was just a, a huge crisis, a, a warning sign. It was all about to come to an end. You know, flash forward uh, 40, 45 years, uh, and we find that the core of the classical music audience uh, is well, it's these same people. <laughs> it's the, it's the, the, the young people of that era. Uh, the, the baby boomers are you know, absolutely uh, the core of the, of the classical audience now, and, and we're very worried about the 20-somethings who are listening to, to you know, Miley Cyrus and Beyonce and, and uh, uh, so on and so forth, and they're never going to, to become interested in, in classical music. But having said that, you know, I, I'm not, you know, I don't want to sound complacent, you know, by any means that we just need to sort of sit back. They'll come to us eventually. No, we actually need to, to work hard to lay the groundwork. Uh, I think you can get young people interested in, in classical music. I mean, I, I was a young person who listened to only classical music up until the age of like, you know, 18 or 19. I, I'm aware that I'm kind of a freak, <laughs> uh, unusual case. Uh, but, you know, there, there are young people out there, whether they're playing instruments or not, who, who, can, who can, you know. Something I always think about is, you know, oh, the, the classical music, it's, it's the elite. You know, it's only for the elite. It's only for the wealthy or this, that, and the other thing. I mean, come on. I mean, when you look at the pop sphere, uh, this is the elite. Uh, these are enormously wealthy uh, superstars who are also able to command, you know, the enormous resources of, 
of corporations and, and, and sort of huge media corporations and, and, uh, and media companies and, and uh, uh, you know, sort of internet companies and so on and so forth sort of falling in line behind them and, and working in synergy with them. It's such a colossus. There's so much money. You know, and then, or you look at sports and the, and the fact that you know, in, in Minnesota, $500 million of, of taxpayer money is, is being spent on, on, a, on a stadium there while the Minnesota Orchestra is, is fighting for you know, a, a million dollars here or $500,000 there to, to stay in business. I, I find it also outrageous that, that classical music that's sort of all the way now on the, on the, on the margin is, is seen as some kind of elite. You know, I mean, we're, we're really a kind of underground, and I think one way to, to, to make the case for this music is, you know, why listen to the same singer that one billion other people uh, you know, are, are, are listening to, why not listen to something more, more unusual, more unconventional, you know, whether it's older classical music or, or some contemporary piece. Alex, and that's one, another soapbox, sorry. We have one more question, and I think that's going to have to be our last one. OK. <laughs> Well, on that note, I think we probably need to wrap it up. I really appreciate you coming out to this fifth symposium for Art Matters on such a terrible day. So thank you to <laughs> Art Matters. <laughs>